Well, one of the most compelling arguments for the Christian faith is simply the fact that it has survived for all of these years. There's a lot of argumentation in the world. What should we believe? Should we believe? The, the, the rate of those who don't believe, or at least those who honestly admit they don't believe, the nuns, has increased in recent years. And the thing that really has, I think, an important bearing on that to attest to why it has survived, um, why it's beaten the odds... I mean, if you look at the, the building blocks of enduring movements, if you, if you study, as I've mentioned before, I've got a degree in history, and if you study the, the building blocks of great nations or of empires, if you study history and you look at those things, you look at the long-lived enduring movements in the world, most of those have been politically dominated. Groups... Or, or leaders that have been, you know, backed by military might or, or maybe sometimes by social efforts that powered by the people kind of thing. Sometimes it was simple as those particular movements had superior weapons over everybody else around them. You study history, you'll see that, where one culture had advanced weaponry over the other and they became dominant. And in some cases, you'll find maybe they built just an incredibly powerful team. But when you study Christianity, when you look at the history of, of our people, Christ followers, when you look at first century Christians, you see these folks were not well organized, right? They had no buildings. They weren't recognized by any government. And in fact, the majority of the people at the time of the creation of the New Testament and on, the majority of the people in that culture, they, they viewed Christianity as a cult. Literally. The Jews thought Christianity was a cult. The other religious groups, the other political groups around the region, these guys are a cult, right? And for nearly three centuries, they remained largely powerless ostracized socially, persecuted politically, tortured physically. Yet, somehow, the movement continued to grow. How do you explain that? Well, if you think back, the early leaders of the church, almost every single one of them, were killed in some gruesome and, and horrific ways. Drawn and quartered, crucified upside down, beheaded, all kinds of just horrific things happened to him. The, the lone exception that we know is the Apostle John. And even John, John was terribly persecuted. He had boiling oil poured on his body, living with scarring till the end of his days. Great persecution, physical suffering, abuse, imprisonment. Now as historians study this movement of Christianity they conclude that its survival is nothing short of remarkable. Care to guess why it survived those rough early centuries until today? What made Christianity different? Why did it continue to have appeal and influence? Well, the simple answer to those questions is what we have been studying this past month or so. It's generosity. See, the early Christians weren't known for their wealth. Most weren't rich. There were some, but most were not rich people. They weren't also at this point known for a, a deep theology even. Their beliefs were considered very odd for the time. And the other religious people, they didn't understand them and in fact felt threatened by them. But what gave the early Christians a voice into their culture was unbelievable compassion and generosity. They had little, but they gave what little they had. And because of this, they were impossible to ignore. 
I can't, I can't overemphasize how big of a shift this was for the people at the time of Jesus. You see, throughout the Greek and Roman times, they were the big dominant cultures then. The, the rule of the day for, for how you treat one another was summed up in a single Latin word. Liberalitas. And this word basically means you give in order to get. You give something in order to get something in return. You scratch my back, I'll scratch yours, right? Quid pro quo. We've heard of that before. And as you can imagine, in a a liberal etos economy, there isn't much use for someone who can't pay you back. I mean, why would you waste your good deeds on someone who couldn't return the favor to you? The whole idea of generosity in that culture was to find someone who you needed something from them and do a good deed for them first. So they would owe you, right? You know how that is. You ever felt like you owed somebody because they'd done something for you? Oh man, now I owe that guy. Right? We still use that phrase today. Oh, yeah, now I owe him one. Right? I got a flat tire, call my friend. Ah, I'll owe you one. Right? We do that. We all do that. And this was the rule of the day for that culture. Their motivation was to give in order to get. And the result of that system is those who have the most to give are the ones who get the most. And then the people who have nothing to give, they get nothing. As long as you had power and wealth to leverage, you had the hope of receiving the very same or even better from others in return. And you might be able to imagine how that could be a problem. Now, it's this that explains why it was so desperate in these times for widows and orphans. Many of them would have been absolutely penniless and powerless. And there was literally no incentive for helping them. They could never, ever return the favor to you. It was commonly understood in that time that that helping a widow or helping an orphan was a waste of your time and your money. There was going to be no return on your investment. So in that culture, basically, nobody did it. Nobody helped them. But then along came Jesus. You see, Jesus showed up on the scene in the middle of this culture and he announces that his kingdom is going to be different. Jesus was pushing a kindness economy. You see, in Jesus' kingdom, people would give with no expectation to be repaid. They would give knowing they weren't going to get anything back. In Jesus' kingdom, you would do for others what they could never do in return for you. Remember Jesus saying, love your enemies? Do good to them? You know your enemies aren't going to pay you back, right? Certainly not with kindness. But when you show kindness, Jesus says then, that your reward will be great. Right? Jesus was a master at challenging his listeners with very provocative questions and stories. He once said that if you love those who already love you, that's no credit to you. He said even sinners, even sinners can love those who already treat them well. And the very same is true for good deeds. Even sinners can do good when somebody's doing good for them, when they're going to get something in return, right? That's the liberalitas. Jesus' style of generosity was different. In essence, Jesus was shifting the world's concept of love. 
Jesus invented a, a great story that we find in Luke 10, 25 through 37. It's one that I suspect everybody in the room is familiar with. It's a story about a Samaritan man who, because of his race, would have been despised by Jesus' listeners, hated by the Jews. You see this Samaritan man, as many of you know, he helps out a non-Samaritan, a Jew, who had been robbed, beaten, and left for dead on the side of the road. Now, under normal circumstances, these two would never have anything to do with one another. They were culturally incompatible. But Jesus picks these two on purpose. His shocked audience would have been leaning in as he was telling the story, wondering what's going to happen. Would, would a Samaritan help a Jew? Would a Jew accept help from a Samaritan? Jesus was making a point. He was saying, this is what it means to be a neighbor. The Samaritan not only helped folks, but if you remember the story, he did so incredibly generously, right? Helps the man, takes him to an inn, gives the innkeeper some money and says, I'm going to come back. You better take good care of him. And if you do, I'll give you some more money if what I've already given you doesn't cover. Right? The Samaritan not only helped, but did so generously, Jesus taught. And Jesus didn't stop there. In John 13, 1 through 17, shortly before Jesus' death, he gathers his followers together for a meal. You see, Jesus was the most powerful and influential person in the room that night. He had been just recently speaking to thousands upon thousands of people each and everywhere he went to speak. The crowds were gathering and growing and pressing in and thousands of people were coming. And here Jesus gets together with his core group, has a meal with them, gathers them together. He's the bigwig, the important guy. Everybody in the room wants to sit next to him. Everybody in the room wants to talk to him. Everybody in the room wants to be seen with him. The disciples had seen all of his miracles. When this guy says, jump, they said, how high, Rabbi? But rather than asking or expecting to be served at this meal or looking for all those in attendance to bow before him at his feet, no. Instead, Jesus does the unexpected. Jesus gets down on the floor and washes everyone's feet. They're filthy Nasty, sweaty, stinky. Did I mention nasty? Filthy, funky feet. When you walk the streets of those times, there weren't flushing toilets. The animals walked the same streets too. It was not a clean place to be. This was a job normally reserved for whoever was lowest on the social totem pole. Whoever had the least status, that was their responsibility. Their job was to wash everyone's feet. And as Jesus did this, he explained to them that the rules were going to be different in his kingdom. Those in authority and power weren't given it for their own benefit. Instead, they were to use it for the good of those who had less power, less authority, and less influence. After Jesus washed their feet... Remember what he did? He told them to go and do likewise. Go and do this for others. And for the next 300 years, they did exactly that. And they took the world by storm with a brand new brand of generosity. Generosity like the world had never seen before. They gave to those who could not return the favor. They served, they loved, they supported those who could not repay. And they did this, and the world was watching. A whole new kind of love entered the world through the small band of people with these strange beliefs. And the world couldn't help but to be drawn to it. 
Generosity was the distinguishing feature of the early church, folks. It was all that they had. But it proved to be more powerful than any amount of money or political power. Generosity changed the world once. What would happen if the church and we as the church people became known once again for inexplicable generosity? Wild generosity. What if we became known for that once again? On nearly a weekly basis, even possibly a daily basis, folks, God presents us with opportunities to be incredibly generous. Now, we might not be able to be generous each and every time. That's not always possible. But we can be generous some of the time. We can be generous with our time, generous with our talents. We can be generous with our treasures. And here's a new one for you. Here's another place you can be wildly generous. You can be generous with your grace. Did you know that? Did you know you could be generous with your grace? It won't cost you a thing, but it might feel like it's going to cost you everything. Love others when they don't love you. When they don't even deserve it. Forgive others. Forgive others first. Even when you didn't do something wrong. Forgive when it doesn't even make sense. Be kind when others are mean. Turn the other cheek. Don't let them drag you down to their level. Speak highly of others. Bless others. Build others up. Love your enemy well. Not, not so we get the glory. Not, not so we get the recognition. Not so that we would get repaid for it someday. Generous. Because we have been blessed. Generous. Because that is what Jesus calls us to be. Generosity that is a reflection of the love Jesus has demonstrated for each and every one of us. No strings attached. Those words are scary. Love with no strings attached. Grace, mercy with no strings attached. Love your enemies well. The best ministry in the world that we can offer on God's behalf isn't to explain our theology. Theology is important. I went to school and paid a lot of money for four years to get a degree in it. It's important. But it's not most important. The most important thing is for us to extend our generosity. Because that is what our Heavenly Father did for each and every one of us when He extended His grace to us. He sent Jesus to die for us to pay a debt we could not pay. Do you get that? A love that is so ridiculously generous that we can never ever make that ledger balance out. What he have gave, we cannot repay. And that's how he wants it to be. And that's what he's asked us to do in return. My hope is that over the last five weeks, you've come to understand just how rich you are. Because odds are, if you're hearing my voice, you're rich. Yes, there are richer people, but there are always er people in our lives, right? Richer, taller, skinnier, smarter, faster, better, er people. But don't let that take away from the fact that most of us, probably all of us, are in the top 4% of wealth in the world. And a lot of us, top 1%. Regardless of what American tax bracket you sit in. 
That's not to make you feel guilty, but to remind you to be grateful. Besides, it's not yours anyway, right? We are called to be stewards, managers. Money managers don't feel guilty. They feel responsible to take care of what they've been given. That brings us to the second point of our series. I hope that you have discovered or been reminded just how to be rich. I hope you've learned along the way here over the last few weeks how to be good at being rich. I hope you've learned we cannot put our hope in the things that moths and rust might destroy. Never place your hope in riches, but place your hope in Him who richly provides. Right? I pray that your hope will never migrate, but will instead stay centered on the only dependable source of our hope. And I hope that from this day forward, you will be more aware of your appetite for stuff and therefore better able to keep it in check. Because just because you can doesn't mean that you should when it comes to buying things and things for self. We have to be intentional about putting ourselves in places where God is working in the world. Places where there is need. Places where your resources that are God's resources can make a true difference for those who lack those resources and opportunities. Like the early church, we have to be intentional about being generous to others if we want to change our world. And you see, the problem is we're resistant to this. For most of us, this does not come naturally. So we have to stretch ourselves a little bit. We have to push outside of our comfort zone. And as we do that, we will show the world that our hope isn't in our ability to hoard these things. But our hope is in the one who gave these things. And I hope that as you begin to live as a rich person, because you are rich, that God would continue to bless you with more. Not so you would have more, but you would have more to be generous with. That you could keep growing in generosity. The Apostle Paul summed this all up incredibly well, and I'd like to close with, a, with his powerful admonition and personalize it for all of us rich people. This is the, uh, call it the Pastor Chris reworked version. But this is the key verse, the very first verse I talked about the very first week. It comes from 1 Timothy 6, 17 through 19. And there Paul writes, and I translate it as, If you are rich in this life, don't be arrogant, and please, don't place your hope in wealth. It's so uncertain. Instead, place your hope in the God who so richly provides you with everything for your enjoyment. Do good. Be rich in good deeds. Be generous and willing to share. When you do that, you lay up a treasure for yourself that serves as a firm foundation for the coming age. And that's not all. Selfless generosity allows you to take hold of life as God intended us to live it. Folks, that is how to be rich. Let's pray.